Yeah, Karen, we just wrapped up a news conference with authorities here in Marshalltown. They tell us right now as many as 9,000 customers lost gas and or electricity. I spoke to Align Energy a short time ago to find out how long it'll take all the, get all those customers back online. Best they can say right now, with all the damage, is to be determined. Now, right now, hotels and shelters are filling up. The Red Cross is taking people to the Meskwaki Casino and Hotel uh, if they need shelter tonight. But the headline of the hour, no serious injuries in the city of Marshalltown. And when you take a look at images like this, buildings that stood for decades disintegrated into the street, it's hard to believe that people were inside these homes and businesses. Didn't hear a, a locomotive like they always say, but all of a sudden my front door started rattling. You could hear the, you know, you could feel the wind and stuff. He's got a, another little room off the side that he had the door screwed shut and it, it blew the whole door frame and everything into the room. It was just another day at the office for Mike Steffen when mother nature intervened. Found a, about a four by four wooden table in a corner back 40 feet into the building and two adults, two kids, all of us got underneath that table. And within like three minutes, I mean, it was quiet, it was done. Please vacate the area for emergency personnel. What Mike and thousands of others in Marshalltown walked out to was a community forever scarred by ferocious winds. And they came right downtown over the top of basically the police department, city hall, the courthouse, and then continued out. Uh, east of town. With the shock of what happened still settling in, one thing is crystal clear. It could have been much worse. She collapsed and I mean she was, I saved my kid's life, but uh, she was just awestruck. I mean this is, I, I've never been anything like this before. Back live here at the county courthouse where earlier you saw a spire taken out by the tornado. The clock now frozen at the time this all happened, but time really didn't stop. And now the long road to recovery begins for the city of Marshalltown. Reporting live in Marshalltown, Nick Weig, CBS. Back now live right now, and we wanted to show you a sight not seen for quite a while here. These are street lights in downtown Marshalltown that are back on tonight. Now, Alliant Energy has had hundreds of crews out here replacing hundreds of destroyed power poles around town. Of course, not everyone's back online, but it's a sign of progress. There's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of red tape they're gonna to have to cut through. They already have the state disaster declaration and in the days ahead, will likely be requesting a federal disaster declaration. Reporting live in Marshalltown, Nick Weig, CBS2 News, 10 at 10. Beginning of the legislative session uh, proposed pretty significant income tax cuts yep. um, to give money back to individuals. Uh, there, there are some plans floating around right now that would include corporate tax cuts. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you said that at this time, well, that seems like a good idea. It's something that the state just can't afford. Is, I that, is that something that you still believe in as that's moving through the state house, Or do you now feel that corporate tax cuts are possible with the current financial situation? Yeah, well, and thank you for asking that question. So we are seeing revenues um, coming in at a higher rate. Uh, I think he'll make a great governor. You ran for governor twice, once successfully, once unsuccessfully. How difficult is it not only to get to this point, but, the, but then to overcome that, that general election in November? Well, it, it really is uh, a lot of work, obviously. And, and I've also been very impressed with... There's been a lot to celebrate here tonight at, at the Democratic Party headquarters in Des Moines, but there is a troubling trend that we've been watching for the Democrats at the top of the ticket. We've seen Fred Hubble's lead, which he held for over an hour, slowly fade. We've seen Kim, uh, Kim Reynolds pull ahead. We're seeing some new numbers showing that that uh, lead is building. And what's troubling about that is we're seeing Democrats flip a seat in District 1. Abby Finkenauer has defeated Rod Blum. But when we're looking at the county numbers in Northeast Iowa, where the four counties in the Northeast corner have picked the winner in the governor's race nearly every race for the last 25 years, they're going Republican in the race for governor. It appears Democrats in Northeast Iowa are not getting the votes for governor that they're getting for Congress. And that could be why we're starting to see a disparity between Democrats scoring some wins in House districts, but not potentially in the race for governor. So something to keep an eye on as the final numbers come in and they appear to be trending towards Governor Kim Reynolds and away from Fred Hubble. Of course, still more to be counted, still very close, and we're going to continue to monitor that from here. But right now, it's a trend that uh, has brought the room down a little bit here in Des Moines. Uh, for now, reporting live in downtown Des Moines, Nick Weig, CBS 2 News.
The 2018 midterms in Iowa turned into a mixed bag of victories and losses for both Republicans and Democrats. In the battle for Iowa's four congressional seats, Democrats scored major victories, flipping District 1 and District 3 to blue. District 4, held by Steve King, now the only Republican from Iowa serving in the U.S. House. The credit for Democrats flipping two seats from red to blue go to Abby Finkenauer in District 1, who defeated Congressman Rod Blum, and Cindy Axney in District 3, who defeated Congressman David Young. Now, if you look at the congressional races from last night, you see a lot of blue here. But if you look at the statewide race for governor, it is a completely different story. Fred Hubble only won 11 counties in central and eastern Iowa, but the margin was still very close. Governor Kim Reynolds came in with just over 50%, Fred Hubble at just over 47%. That's because Hubble ran up the numbers in some of the heaviest populated areas of Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, Dubuque, Waterloo, Quad Cities, and of course Des Moines. But it wasn't enough to overcome the margins that Governor Reynolds was getting in more rural parts of the state in all of these counties. He also didn't win some key counties he needed to, some of the smaller metro areas like Sioux City, Fort Dodge, and Mason City. And in Northeast Iowa, especially in the top four counties right here, Fred Hubble was not getting as many votes as fellow Democrat Abby Finkenauer. So what this all boils down to is both Democrats and Republicans scored some victories here in Iowa, with Republicans maintaining almost complete control of state politics, while Democrats will get more influence in national politics. Nick, Kelly, 50 years ago, weather technology as we know it today was in its infancy. In fact, just two years after the tornado, we became the second television station in the entire country to show radar to our viewers. But this is what it looked like. No way of really deciphering what you were looking at other than rain. So in 1968, the spotters on the edge of town in Olwine were really the only line of defense. And for Olwine 50 years ago today, those eyes provided the critical seconds needed to save countless lives. I was right up here at the high school. Um, I was a sophomore in high school. Susan Mauser stayed after school to watch a friend rehearse for a variety show. An average May afternoon in Olwine until 4.57 p.m. A classmate came running into the gym and I was sitting there and he says, there's tornadoes coming. Susan and her friend ran to the windows to see this, a multi-vortex tornado coming right for them. Dozens of kids scrambled for shelter, but they didn't get far. They scattered and I got my friend and we were in a small area right offside the stage and that the doors sucked shut, we couldn't get any further. The siren sounded in Old Wine for just 15 seconds before the tornado cut the power. But in Old Wine, they had little if any warning at all. It was in the edge of town before any word got out. Minutes later, Susan and her friends emerged from the high school to a town completely foreign to them. Cars were flipped. The metal um, posts were bent. It was just unbelievable how it all had changed. One survivor told me that her loved ones couldn't reach her because of all of the debris across town. So instead, they came right here to Mercy Hospital, the tallest point in Olwine. And from here, they could see that her trailer was intact. Communication lines were cut. There was no way to let loved ones know that you were okay. So the local radio station began alerting people to telegrams coming in from concerned relatives so they could respond. And there was another way that word got out. There was ham operators. They used that to to try to get the word out the Red Cross was in right away. After that, the long road to recovery began, but the people of Olwine did it together. There was a lot of tragedy and a lot of devastation, a lot of damage, but it was a time where everyone put everything else aside, and if somebody needed help, there was help. She took to see it just took the whole wall right out of it. Today, Susan shares the stories with her grandkids, learning for the first time about their city's brush with disaster, something Susan looks back on with pride. When something like that happens, it's nice to see that you live in a community that um, just has one common interest and um, that you live in an area that has that immediate feeling. And, and we did.